Okay, so I'm going to tell you, Ian, I, we've only known you for about 40 minutes now, but does the phrase that it's unpredictable but exciting permeate how you live your life? 100%. The motto is it's a damn good day to have a damn good day, right? Right. It came from that decision that you made about life. Kind of crazy. And you can tell all of that by doing the work that I do with people. And we're live. We're here with the legendary Forbes Riley coming in hot from the San Diego hotel room. Always on the move. I'm so glad you're here. Thanks for taking the time. Well, you are most welcome. You know what? When you've got a smile like yours and a name like that, how could I not show up? Seriously? <laughs> I love it. I love it. And before we even jump into any of this, Something I've always admired about you, and, and I've just kind of been, you know, creeping on the DL, always following some of the stuff you're doing, and is that your ability to constantly reinvent yourself, right? Like you do these, you hit these milestones, you build this fitness business, you go into motivational speaking, you be going to sales training, but you just keep going and you just keep changing up who you are, and, but you're the same person, but new, new versions of yourself. And that's just very admirable. I think a lot of times people hit that stagnation standpoint. And you've always seemed to just push people to go, go, go. Have you been like that your whole life? No, actually, I'm in evolution. I am the, I'm the sum total of my obstacles. And I talk about that very often. I think a couple of really smart things that I did, and I didn't necessarily realize it at the time, was one, to wait till I was 42 to have kids. Because by definition, at 42, when most people are kind of getting in the groove, the kids are in college, they slow down. I was just starting a whole new life and a whole new invention of what does it mean to have babies and toddlers and first graders and middle schoolers and high schoolers. My kids just graduated and now my daughter and son run my company and they run it up to a million dollars in a year during COVID. I gotta tell you, so you have to stay fresh and innovative. Otherwise my kids go, mom, you're old. I'm like, yeah, I don't wanna be old. I wanna stay young my whole life. So I have completely shifted who I am based on them. And I'm so glad I waited. I did turn 61, which freaks me out because I think that number is big. And when I was growing up, I look at pictures of my mom at 40. She didn't look like I do now at 61. And then I decided to fall in love with a guy who's 17 years younger. And in six weeks, we will win Mr. Olympia. So physically, if I'm standing next to a Greek god physically, you got to keep going, right? You don't have a choice. So I think setting myself up for that is like setting goals. You know, my daughter and I, we teach a class this morning called GSD, get shit done. And every four weeks we have people do things. So it's great for entrepreneurs. For last month, we all got an ebook done. This month, we're all getting an online course. Next month, it's building a funnel in four weeks. And I found myself saying to everybody, stop letting the perfect ruin the good. And that finishing is happiness. And so if you're somebody who waited your entire life, oh, I've been writing on this book for like three years, you know what? The last book I did was 18 days from conception to completion to literally in the store, 18 days. Now we did that to prove a point that you could do it. So life is much more fun because I think finishing is happiness. And so that's part of it. There it is. And first off, you saying you're 61, it seems like a lie. Your skin is fantastic. I don't know what you're taking, girl, but if you don't have a skincare line, hurry it up. I know, but right? I do have one called Forbes Flawless. Um, there, and there I do know... And that is part, you know, it's funny. You said something earlier. How old are you, my darling? I am 29. Oh my gosh. I have old, I have underwear older than you. They're not that I'm wearing today, but because I'm not wearing any underwear. No, just kidding. Here, <laughs> just kidding. here, here we are. <laughs> you can't do that to a young man and make him kind of blush. I'm not having a great time. If, I'm, mean, not, if night, I'm not blushing, it's not a good time. You know, here we are. Last night on my mastermind, I had Elaine LaLanne. Now, I don't know if you remember Jack LaLanne. I don't. See, now that's so sad. So when people ask me about my legacy, if Jack doesn't have a legacy, then none of us ever will. Jack invented the word fitness, had the very first health club in 1930s and had a legacy. He was on television for 34 years, black and white TV. Your grandmother and mine watched him and his wife. He passed away about nine years ago. He was very big into juicing and health and fitness. And he created a lot of things that we take for granted today, like instant breakfast, like the machines we see in the gym with pulleys. He built all of those things. And so I just spent a couple of days up in Northern California with Elaine LaLanne, she's 95. And she has great skin and she smiles and laughs every day. And she inspired my whole room of people because I look at her and go, I still have 30 more years to get to that. And she has a book with her on the cover of it when she was 60 and she looked better than most people at their thirties. So if you surround yourself with people, set goals and milestones and then just set out to achieve them. And I've always been a big believer since, I, by the way, at your age, I was not this person. 
I might have been somewhere inside, but at your age, I'd already, when I graduated college, I skipped a year of college. I did three years of college. I got two degrees. That's kind of unique. Most people don't do that. I'm a little smarter than the average person. And so conventional education just bored me to tears. So, and I, you know, that's just kind of how I was wired. And then I went off in my twenties to just live my life. I was going to be a lawyer. That didn't, I said, that's not going to work. And someone inspired me. I always wanted to be an actress. I went off to New York City without a dime in my pocket, got the lead in my very first feature film called Splatter University, which is available on YouTube. I don't know if you've watched it, but you should. Splatter, and okay. Splatter University. And then I decided what I've wanted. The only thing that's been consistent my whole life is I've always wanted something. And most entrepreneurs don't. So growing up as a young kid, I wanted to be pretty. I had a broken nose and frizzy hair. I had braces for eight years. I had a really weird palate. I grew up for a year, I talked like this. And very frustrating. And then at some point I said, I want to be James Bond. And so I started to live my life in my 20s as though I was James Bond. I traveled around Europe with a backpack. I had adventures. I jumped off moving trains. I went off to work at Club Med and lived around the world and scuba dived and snow skied and got paid to do all of that. And there was no blueprint for any of the things that I said I wanted to do, except I wanted to be James Bond. That seems kind of goofy. And at 29, I, that had kind of run its course. And then I said, I'm going to go to LA and really fulfill this acting thing. I'd already actually gotten on Broadway in New York City. And I walked into, men, into LA and walked into a comedy club, the comedy club called The Laugh Factory, and ended up becoming the host every Friday and Saturday night for three years. I don't even understand how a lot of that happened, except I just wanted it. And I also checked the word fear at the door. When I asked people, there was like fear. You know what that is? False evidence appearing real. Your life is on the other side of what makes you uncomfortable. So I've always had that little rumbly in my tummy where I'm like a little uncomfortable. Should I do this? Should I not do this? I got on stage with Grant Cardone. I was his guest speaker in front of 10,000 people because I had the courage to walk up to him in a hotel room in Las Vegas and say, you know, rather than introduce myself and tell him what I'm up to, I said, you need an infomercial. You really need to catapult yourself. I've been on 194 of them. I've grossed $2.5 billion. You want to up-level your game? Talk to me. And he did. The pitch landed and that's why you're the pitch queen. And I like that your whole tactic is all about getting to yes. I watched some of your videos and it's all about getting people to say yes. If they get in that yes mode, you're going to be getting and closing more sales. Can you tell us about where, when that really hit you? Okay. So that's also one of those things that I did not plan. And it's okay if you don't plan specifically, but you have to have a goal. You have to have a dream. You have to have something you're going towards. And so I'm in, in Los Angeles. I'm acting in movies. I'm acting on television. I'm hosting shows. And by the way, the very first thing that I hosted, nobody ever gave me anything, which is interesting. I kind of, I earned it. So the first thing I did when I wanted to host, I very rarely share this story, but I was like, how do you get to be a TV host? And people said, well, you need demo tapes. I'm like, of what? Now this is before YouTube and cell phones and now it's so easy. But I went to my local TV station and I said, I wanna host something. They said, well, what do you do? I said, I could host anything. I could, let's talk about food. And I created a show called We'll Work for Food. And the opening was I'm standing on the Los Angeles freeway with a, a, a sign, a cardboard sign says, we'll work for food. And I took their camera guy and we went into all the local restaurants. I got to eat for free and did a review of the restaurant. And that turned into a nice little show. And that was step number one. So a couple of years later, I walk into an audition now that I'm this host and there was a pen on the table, a camera, and it said, sell me this pen. Now, Ian, I personally, I don't like selling. I don't like being sold. I get uncomfortable about it. And I kind of thought it was a joke. So I said, huh, you know, funny thing about pens, but my mom, when I was in college, used to write me longhand notes. I was only 16 when I got there. I was really young. And I'd run to the mailbox. And there was this note in purple ink. And I realized a pen like this could reach out and touch somebody's heart. Well, Jake, a body by Jake, comes out of the dark, grab her fridge, you're going to make me a lot of money. And that was my very first pitch. I would then, with his love of me, I guess, we created a network called the Cable Health Club, which turned into Fit TV. It aired 24 hours a day. And I created, wrote the pitches, and hosted the pitches for the first 1,500 products ever on television. Now imagine this, no one had sold a fitness product on TV before I got there. I didn't know what I was doing. There were no rules and I made them up. He sold that network to Fox for $500 million. It launched the infomercial industry. I rode the wave like a super surfer, 
posted the first 35 infomercials with George Foreman and Beach Bodies and Tony Little and the rest is history. So QVC came after that? Oh yeah. QVC Nature's and how were they only were born like 40 years ago. So yeah, all of that. And by the way, my very first time on QVC came out of that. And it was for a product called Biodepolis. Rule number one, never sell anything you can't pronounce. Number two, never sell anything you don't love. But they offered me, I go to QVC, it's brand new, weird building with all of these cameras that didn't have operators. Everything was remote controlled. And I got very, very uncomfortable. And my first appearance, I bombed. I left with my tail between my legs going, shit, that was horrible. I am never doing that again. A year later, they called and said, hey, we're doing this elliptical trainer, this fitness product. And the girl who was doing it before you was going six trips to there and made 70,000 for the year. Now, when you're an actress, if you're going to be a waitress as a side job, 70 grand sounds really good. I'm like, okay, I'll do that. Sure, why not? What the genius for me, that's the unwritten rule. I don't know how this part happened. Was that I, even though I'm not a fitness expert or I wasn't, I was a dancer, but I always fought my weight. I got bullied for having big thighs, but I knew intuitively what fitness products did for people. I'd written 1500 pitches. It was my little wheelhouse and it was called the Orbitrack and it clicked. My first year, I tripled her sales. I made $210,000 selling this goofy little elliptical trainer and Honestly, that just catapulted me. I'm in the National Fitness Hall of Fame. I'm the only one who doesn't have like a bodybuilding medal, but I can sell more products than anybody when it comes to health and fitness. It's interesting when you like taking a step back, when you said, when you first met the gentleman uh, in the audition and he goes, you're going to make me a ton of money, right? And you have that moment, right? That kind of serendipitous type of moment. Do you feel that you're just very open to opportunities? And that's been like a, a big key that you're, you're just like you're mentioning, you're just open, you're open to trying new things at all stages of life. Do you get down on yourself? And when you do get down on yourself, what's your rebound strategy? Wow. Okay. So that's three major questions. One, I see the white space. Now that's an interesting sentence. My dad was an inventor. Now I also come from a very unique background, which allows me to be where I am, which why I teach what I do because most people didn't have the benefit of having the wacky childhood. My dad was a magician, so I do magic tricks all the time. So I'm used to literally sitting at dinner with you and having the napkin disappear or the, the whole drink kind of pour out of nothing. I do that all the time. So I always, one, feel comfortable in the center of attention, but because I know that there's something wonderful about it, it's not like, look at me, look at me. It's like, wow, I'm gonna do something amazing and you're gonna totally be blown away, which by the way is how, and I know we'll get to it at some point, but how I managed to sell two and a half million of my little spin gyms, because I'm used to people saying, wow, Forbes, that's just amazing. But my dad was also an inventor and inventors look at a whole space and say, wow, I could put something there. I can tinker, I can build it. Well, that's what I do with business as an opportunity. And I love that you glommed onto that because it's why I'm on your show today. I didn't ask twice about being here. I put together your energy, who you are, the way you wrote your emails. Yeah, I'm showing up. I look at people all the time now and go, oh, if you do this and I do this, we could create that business, that JV relationship and make money. And I'm always finding that spark. And also when it comes to pitches, that's the white space. People come to me with their idea and your idea is yours, but how do you get it to someone else? That space in between is my zone of genius. I work very hard to get people to understand, stop telling your customer, your prospect, your friend what they need. Oh, you need this noni juice. You need to lose weight. You need to tone your arms. No, get them to want what you have. And it's crazy. When I talk about Spin Gym, I don't tell you what it is. Ian, here's my entire pitch. You ready? Ready. You want to see something cool? Of course. That's my first yes. That's the first sentence of my pitch. You already just said yes to me. And now you're kind of like, all right, I want to see something cool. What do you got? That means you're open and available in one sentence. And then what I will do is literally take this and say, give me your thumbs. And you will give me your thumbs. Give me your thumbs. Now, why did you give me your thumbs? You and I are in two different cities. Because you can't actually you're, you're, touch it. Because they're very convincing. Here we are. <laughs> right, because I asked you to. You know, it's so funny. I'm actually doing a little Facebook Live on this. And my favorite 
<laughs> direct response director Bruce Dworsky just popped in and he has a couple of theories. He and I have written some of the most award-winning shows of all time. And one of our techniques has to do with telling people what to do. You know what? I want you to pick up your phone right now. Guys, I want you to go to Instagram right now and look up Forbes underscore Riley and give me a like, give me a follow. You gave me your thumbs. Now, it takes a lot of interesting confidence to be able to do that in life and in business. But when your heart is in the right place and you serve enough people, it becomes a wonderful habit. I know that I over deliver. I know that my classes are designed to get people to make more money, to get their things out to life and really just step up your game. Because the other question I think you asked is I'm living a wonderful life right now because I built it by design. I created this. It doesn't just happen. Well, you find things that you're passionate about and you, you grab onto them. I think a lot of times we fall into situations where we find something that's just all right and we just roll with it instead of being like, you know, finding the spark that brings out our inner Forbes gets us so excited about life. But how do oh, how, Ian, Ian, wait, you just coined it your inner Forbes? No one has ever said that. That is yours. Bring out your inner Forbes. <laughs> the, the Forbes name is such a great name in society, you know? Well, I'll tell you something. I know you had a question, but I'm going to give you this real quick. We actually coined the phrase to Forbes it. What does it mean to Forbes something? And that means to manifest it, especially when no one else thinks it's possible. Here's how I know I've got a great idea. I tell five people, they go, oh, you can't do that. Perfect. That's the idea I'm going for. Because if the average mind does can't even grasp it, I know I'm onto something. So well, what you, have you done Forbes lately? There it is, but you're making it fun too. And I think a lot of times people are just so bored and to come in with energy and a smile, like you mentioned in the beginning, makes such a big difference. Just the first impression to be able to come in and just impact people on an emotional basis, right? Like someone was telling me recently, why do you have so many of your clients' cell phone numbers? And how do you get people to start texting, right? Because you know, an email is a very formal, like, hello, Forbes, this is Ian Lenhart's. I would like a minute of your time. Best dash Ian, right? It's like, what? And then you continue to do this for like 10 times, right? But if you're texting, it's like, yo, Jim, what up? Hey, you free? What's good? You know, it's like quick things and it creates trust. How do you build that trust with someone that you're not this sleazy salesperson and you're now just sort of a person behind the mic? Does that make sense? Oh, it totally makes sense. What's interesting looking at you though at 29 that you figured some of this out because at 29 I don't think I'd have figured out as much but because of the internet technology having some great friends listening to podcasts like this my 18 year olds are light years ahead of me when I was that age which is so exciting but I will tell you a couple of things that I did learn I'm listening to you and I'm intrigued by the way you're approaching things and I think at a certain age you have to flip back and figure out what's going on because life is changing so fast. Don't discount a nine-year-old like I did who comes to you and says, mommy, can I have a hundred dollars for Bitcoin? I'm like, no, I don't even know what a big, no, I don't, not a, mommy, can I have $500 for Bitcoin? Would you stop with this thing? I don't even know what it is. I can't even find it on the internet. Go away. Mommy, Bitcoin just went to $60,000 and I could have been a mega millionaire. You blew it. <laughs> oh God. If I could turn back the hands of time on that one conversation. So I'm listening to you and I would ask you, where does your spirit come from? Lust for understanding. I mean, the whole concept of the podcast originally came from a selfish desire to explore my own passions, right? Because there's so much interesting niches and in marketing, they always talk about, you got to find your niche and then go all in on it market to it, talk to about it, build it. Then you're going to get people on your podcast. But what if you're into like five to 10 different things and you can't find your spark? So well, I just, wait, 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 stop right there. So you're into five to 10 different things and can find your spark. First of all, if you're into five, to 10, that's perfect. I have a hundred things that I love to do. My thong is like, when you go to a buffet, no matter how much food there is, you can only put one bite of one thing in your mouth at a time. So why don't you just kind of delve into that? And I will tell you, most of what you're going to delve into is a hobby. It doesn't become a raging business. That's a little bit of a fluke there. But if you love doing it, go down a road and explore it. And by the way, when you're 29, this is the thing I tell everybody. I just, I've got some business partners. I have a new product called PRmediakits.com. And my two partners just turned 21, uh, Casey Adams and Kieran O'Brien. And I, I'm on, I've been with them since they were like 16 years old. They were 16-year-old protégés of a Grant Cardone's and Ty Lopez, and we all became friends and I've supported them since then. And now they're raging, right? I looked at a really young audience in LA last week and I said, could you guys all just take a freaking breath? 61 here. 
I've had four of your lifetimes to get where I am. When I was 29, I was on a beach in Turks and Caicos for about three or four years working for Club Med, learning how to play tennis and golf and scuba dive. And I did all their shows and I learned how to speak several different languages. And I lived a life that was extraordinary. And I made $15 a day but I had free room and board, free access to everything and all the cutest guys you could imagine running around in little Speedos. I was a very happy little girl. I didn't actually think about, oh, I need to make millions in the bank and I have a whole entire legacy. I was 29. So one of the things I think you guys put a lot of pressure on yourselves to be so successful at such a young age. If you do that, I guarantee you will miss your life. I took a backpack and I turned around Europe for six months. Nobody knew where I was because there were no cell phones. And I had an amazing time. And I wrote a book about that, which I never published, by the way, because I didn't do this for the fame. I did it for the story. I did it for the adventure. And I love telling these stories now, but I'm listening to life coaches. I'm a life coach. Really, how old are you? 22. You know what? Call me when you get a life. Life coaching is not something you read in a book about how to do it for someone. So I would recommend that everybody who's worried about their brand, knock it off. If you're into five and 10 different things, go explore each one of them. Spin gym did not happen until I was 50 years old. Yeah, I think, yeah, 50, well, yeah, 50 years old. Well, that, why that's, that's why it's so exciting because the idea is if I can get in the minds of these people that are doing living a life that I may want to live, if I can just jump into their lens for a minute, I can fast track the years of learning and just see like, what's it like? Like I great stories, my friend, Lisa Kitasaho. I see this girl one day on Instagram, she's hanging out with cheetahs, right? I'm like, what's going on with that? Who hasn't dreamed of hanging out with lions and cubs and all that stuff. And I ended up just DMing her similar to you. And we ended up becoming friends. She, she was on the podcast twice. She went to a trip to Africa. Next thing you know, she ends up becoming the head of the cheetah conservation there and has been living in South Africa doing this stuff for so long. And it's amazing. So you think about what's a better path? What would bring me that happiness? But like you mentioned, I am guilty of that. I am guilty of constantly asking myself, what's this? What's this? What do I need to do? So I really appreciate me, you mentioning that. Give me a favor. Give me a, give me a, make me co-host so I can share a screen with you really quick. I'm going to blow your mind right now. Now, here's a funny story about leaping into things. I don't know if you noticed, but see the cheetah behind me and the cheetah in front of me. This is one of my all-time wackiest stories that I don't even understand myself. My ex-husband and I, uh, he lived in Africa. We go to Africa for a long time. Oh, all right. So we wanted to go to Africa. And I said, we should go to Africa before I have kids. So what are you Forbes lately is about manifesting your life any way that you want it. He said, I said, how much money do we need to go to Africa? He said, probably like $10,000. Well, we didn't have a spare $10,000, but I said, I want to go to Africa. I want to go on this safari with my ex, or he was my husband at the time. Do you know that within a week of that happening, I went to an audition for a Charles Schwab commercial. I went on a Sunday. I was kind of cranky and I booked the job. You know how much they paid me for the television, the radio and the print ads was exactly $10,000. Within two weeks of that, we booked a six week trip to Africa. So now see, I'm holding my camera. Yeah. We have a friend who has her own, uh, her whole, the whole, uh, what do they call that safari, but a whole, whatever, it's like 50,000 and 100,000 acres, something ridiculous. And she has four cheetahs, two of them roam free and two of them were kind of in this little chicken wire thing. She says, hey, you know, go have some fun, but just beware that I just bought two gazelles and the cheetahs ate them. So I'm not very, I'm not very happy with my cheetahs right now. Okay, I think I heard her say that right. We have a guy with a gun who only speaks Swahili. We're going around the whole property. We see rhinos and she has her own like giraffes and it's amazing. We get to the very top and there's this chicken wire thing and there's these two cheetahs. Now, I do not know, Ian, what inspired me to do this. My ex has a little camera. I have my big camera. The guy we're with doesn't speak English. I, for some reason, feel possessed to walk into the two cheetahs and start to pet them like he's a cat. I do not know the last time he ate. I don't know anything about them. I don't ever recommend being as stupid as I was. And so I pet this cheetah. Now, really stupid to turn your back on another wild animal. There's nothing tamed about them. They're not in a circus. They're not in a show. And I don't know what her insurance policy was. But I'm down there. I felt compelled to do this. Then the cheetah playfully grabbed my camera and it jerked my neck. And I thought, oh God, what am I doing? And I remember backing out and asking my ex, what just happened? He's like, I was taking pictures because I thought that's the last time I'm going to see you. 
I don't know why you did that, but here's an amazing photo. And that's my cheetah story. <laughs> Having done research since then, you know, this is when people die, when you want to put the cute grizzly bear and, oh, look, let's just get a picture of him driving our car and he kills you. So I have no idea. I don't take any responsibility for how that picture happened or what was going on in my head at the time. I just am grateful to the universe that I'm actually here and can tell the story and have no scars. Isn't that crazy when you have life just throws you those moments where you just think, wow, I am the world's biggest dumb, dumb. And I just almost ended my life just being maybe just ignorant and stupid. I mean, I have a, I have a similar story ish about drowning and drowning in the ocean, not that exciting with cheetahs, but more so just didn't realize I was basically hypothermic and I was very far away. And you, next thing you know, you realize like, wow, this is how people die, you know? And you're like, how did I make this decision? How did I end up here? Uh, but if you don't jump, you just never know. Well, but that's an interesting, even that word that you just used jump, because that's how I end a lot of my speeches. If you don't live life really fully, you don't know what it means to really experience it. I talk about that if you, you may only live once, but if you live once right, it may be enough. And what happens from your moment and my moment is a level of gratitude that some people never experience. I have a category in my head called massive gratitude. And there was a moment where I, I don't take things for granted. My dad spent three years in the hospital when I was a kid, he slipped and cut off the whole front of his hand. I know what it's like to watch a man that I love go through 15 operations to, to make sure that he survived. But there was a moment when we were in Los Angeles I just got a new Lexus, a little SUV. I'm so proud of it. And I have these two beautiful baby twins and my daughter's in the back seat. I'm at an intersection and I, you know, that new car smell that you just love. And with that, she throws up like a projectile all over my new car. And I have this moment where I'm at the intersection. I turn to my right. I see the car next to me with some kids or whatever. And I look back at her and I'm a little pissed. I'm like, oh my God, you have that, oh, and it's horrible. And I'm, I'm, I'm angry, who knows what I am. It took the second that saved my life. Because as I was turning back, I guess the light had turned green, the car to my right went into the intersection as they were plowed over by a semi truck. If I'd stepped on the gas, I wouldn't be here. I never forget that moment when I'm running late or somebody cuts me off, I just go, hey dude, thank you. Because that moment of her throwing up saved our life. I have no doubt about that. It's interesting you mentioned that because your whole gig is that you're a sum of your obstacles. And it's interesting that adversity makes us proud of ourselves and people, right? You see these situations where if someone was given everything, they never appreciate anything, right? But you worked your butt off, you were told no, and you finally get there and you get 10 views on your video. And you're like, look at me now, girl. You know, you just get that that sugar, you know, and then people can feel that sugar. If you walk in a room, it's like, damn, that girl's got some sugar. But versus some people who look like they have it all, but don't have the sugar. What do you think separates people that, that, that got the sugar and people that might look like they do, but deep down, they're just not there? Well, what separates them is exactly that. I worked for, when I, went, when I graduated college, I went to work for a billionaire because I, I love that I grew up not having anything. Now, that's not true. I had a lot of things. I had the love of two parents who thought that I was special, even though I was a goofy, ugly, weird little kid. They always took pictures of me and told me I could do anything and just loved me. I think love is the only thing that kids need. I don't think it's money because I, when, I, when my dad was in the hospital, his room overlooked the only mansion in my hometown. And I could see, because you couldn't see it from the street because the trees were too thick, but overhead you could see the two giant chimneys and the, the circular driveway. And I used to just fantasize thinking, wow, what's like dinner like in that house? What's Halloween and Christmas like? Because we didn't have all that. We had a tiny little house. And then I went to work for a billionaire and they were a little spoiled. And he was older and she was a lot younger. And I list, we had barons and earls and princes over for dinner. I mean, these guys let me be their social secretary when I didn't even know what the word meant. And I'm from New York and I'm talking like this. And I think they thought I was just kind of cute, but because I just want to be an actress, I just want to learn from them. But they let me do this job and live in their little guest closet, wherever that was. As, and I used to create all these dinners and I, I changed their lives and they changed mine. And I remember one time, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Grace, we're in the car and she looked at me and said, can you please get Louis Vuitton out of the trunk? And I actually turned to her and I'm like, who's in the trunk? And she's like, oh, you'll learn. And I'm like, oh, you're so right, I will. And that's been the journey of my life. So I've had an opportunity to meet very, very wealthy people. 
And this was an interesting issue too, because as I started to get money, how do you raise your children? Do you give them everything? Do you make them work for things? And I think I found a good balance because my kids tell me that I did. They know that they've had access to a lot of things. They know that we've traveled to the Great Wall of China. We've been over to Germany and we've been to Italy, but they see their mom working and they know how hard that is. And I always make sure that we give back. But there's a whole part of society where the parents were so wealthy, and I saw a lot of this, that the kids were just given everything because there was not a lot of necessarily love, some were, but when you have everything and you have no purpose. So I think I'm on this planet right now to be a beacon and a role model for people who don't have anything, for people who feel like misfits and they don't belong, who don't understand what this is all about and think they're a failure. I'm like, hey, yeah, come on over to my, come on, come on to my playground because I got you covered. Because all those crazy things that you've gone through, I teach a course called Breakthrough, where Ian, I take people who've been raped, molested, forced to dig their own grave and jump into it by their mother and shift their lives so that they matter because that's my tribe. That's my group of entrepreneurs because I will tell you what, the juice tastes a lot sweeter when you had to squeeze the berry on your own. And nothing's better than orange juice, fresh squeezed. When you see the juice coming off, you're like, damn, I just. But now wait, now imagine if you took the seed and you were the one to plant the orange seed in the ground, you water the seed, you waited, you watered and it didn't, why aren't you growing? And then one day, oof, there's a little green thing. And then you watch over the years as it becomes this tree and there's all a bunch of oranges and you're the one to pick the orange and you, you know where that orange came from. It was a decision that you made five years ago. And this is important for everyone to know because Ian, you and I are gonna talk when you're 35 years old and you're gonna go Forbes, thank you. Because now I have X, Y, and Z that I didn't even think about, but I planted the seeds today that became the orange that I'm gonna in a wonderful way. Or you're just a person who goes $10 for a fresh squeeze orange, just give me one. They have no appreciation for what went through the process to get there. I liked what you mentioned about raising children and, and your philosophy and, and getting the feedback of your kids and thinking you found the right middle ground there. I don't have kids. I'm 29 single, about to be the father of a Maine Coon cat, and I'm pretty excited about it. But today I am riding solo. Uh, but I've heard from many successful people and parents that it's so important just to speak to children and let them know that they can do stuff and let them know that it is possible, right? And just letting them know that there are 16 year olds running YouTube channels with millions of subscribers. There are 17 year olds, you know, raising cheetahs. There are 18. And once you know it's possible, all of a sudden your brain starts to work out the kinks. What if everyone was just told it's possible? You know, that'd be crazy. But they're not. In fact, most kids are put down. Most kids, I, I teach a lot of people who have broken my heart. I didn't know that molestation happened as much as it does. But can you imagine that you're a little four year old girl and for three or four years of your life, you're terrified to come home from school or go to bed at night because grandfather, father, neighbor, brother are coming into your bed to touch you and then tell you, even now you feel uncomfortable and weird and dirty, that if you ever tell anyone, I will kill you and your family. And they live with this. And I'm going to tell you, as you're looking for a girl in your life or a boy in your life, have that conversation about how they grew up because they don't always say those things, but I will tell you, it comes out later and people hide who they really are out of shame and guilt. I have people take those stories in and get them on stages and talk about them because the more that we heal, the more that, and I'm actually created a thing called the healing because it happens to so many people that it's not. And I think the more we talk about it, the more people are going, oh my God, that was part of my life too. And especially for the little boys who are like, this was what I dealt with. And then you wonder why they might grow up to be a cop who's kind of angry or a serial killer or a guy who beats his girl. They're very angry. They were very hurt and they don't lose that. There are mechanisms in place to, to take handle that. My other thought at 29, I love being alone. I love being single. I also love being in love. And so don't rush into that. When you are the best version of you, that other side finds you. And then find somebody who is also whole. And if they're not whole, make sure they get to some, some training. And I'm not going to say therapy. I don't believe in therapy, but I believe in breakthrough seminars and, and experiences where you can let go of the anger you've got because mom told you that you were worthless or dad said this. Everybody has that. How you release it to clean out the closet of your house that's stuffed with crap. Because you don't want to move in, a, in somebody's house who's a hoarder. 
You're like, where do I fit in, right? But emotionally, that's what so many people do. They hoard all of that. And then the last thing, I don't know, I know that you've been stalking me, which I love. I really do. I think this is awesome because this is what I'm doing in life. But this is my love now. This is the man that I am so enamored with, who is a little younger than me. And right now, this is a picture we just took in Los Angeles. And I'm going to say that I must, I win. <laughs> because as handsome as Joshua Self is, that's how nice he is. And this last two years, Ian, you kept saying about reinventing. That man was in a horrific motorcycle accident on January 2nd of a year and a half ago. He was shattered, his ankle, he was in a coma, his ribs, he was completely taken out by a kid who had no insurance, who was racing out of a bank and bam. For six months, he sat in a wheelchair. And so now I thought I had everything going on, I'm doing all this and I'm watching this man that I love be broken and in and, and pain every night, just horrible. He wakes up six months after this happened in a wheelchair looking scrawny and skinny. And he says to me, October, 2021, I'm gonna go for Mr. Uni Mr. Olympia. And I remember thinking, oh dear God, please don't, it's, and you know what? When, you're, when you meet a champion, when you meet somebody who's God's graced with this, this, this power, this will, he stood up with his crutch. He had me take a picture of him, which is before photo. And that is now his after photo after a year of two hours in the gym, being a vegetarian, eating right, and every day saying October 6th, October 6th. Guys, it's coming up in six weeks. I'm excited to see how this unfolds because that's been his dream and his goal. And it inspired me to help a whole lot of other people. And I said, Joshua, my, my, my whole thing is you're the sum of the obstacles. See, before January 2nd, before the accident, you were just perfect. You look perfect. You, everyone thought, oh, that's unattainable. But now we've watched you put all that muscle back, crawl to the gym when it, you felt like shit on certain days and you did it. And so I think that that crazy accident was the catalyst for him impacting millions of lives in a more profound way. Your next course is going to be BYOM, build your own man, because you manifested <laughs> that. that. That man's a, that, that's it. That's not a, even, a, that's an action figure you just showed me. He <laughs> <laughs> does look like an action figure, doesn't he? Oh yeah, dude's crushing it. <laughs> well, but I'll tell you what, he's also got his own levels of insecurity. He is a little boy whose dad was killed when he was two years old. Dad married the, the, his brother the, several years later, they were in a small town and to help raise the two boys. And at 15, that man was killed by a car. So my beautiful man had his heart shattered twice, was looking for role models, and now has just decided that he just gets to be one for everyone else. That's like uh, the only downside, I think, of someone who's a lover and has empathy and has lots of good friends and friendships. And I always say, if, if you want to have a lot of friends, you have to be a good friend, right? Rule number one. But you also share in a lot of pain. It's like the only downside, you know? Because if you love a lot of different people, we live in a, a, an earth in the middle of time and space on a rock, crazy shit happens. And when that happens, it feels like it happens to you. And it's always interesting to me if I haven't talked to someone in three to five years and something really bad happens to them. You just have this moment where you're just, you're broken for a second. You feel their pain. And it's interesting that the human connection can do that, right? You can meet someone and then feel sort of like what they're feeling. Wow, aren't you just a beautiful person? Are your parents married? They are, yeah. Yeah, and I know that because I can feel that from you. So you can tell a lot about a person. And I do this a lot in my work because you have a really sweet heart. And it comes from loving parents. What does your dad do for a living? He is a, he's a sales guy for, for selling ads for a newspaper the last 30 years. That's excellent. And I can feel that from you. So here's another thing I do with clients. What's your, what's your first memory in life? First memory in life? <sighs> I remember there was this one time we went camping. I don't know if this is the first one, but it popped up. So I'm rolling with it. And it was a, a thunderstorm, lightning storm while we were going camping. And I remember there was trees falling everywhere and it was like crazy. And I remember being under the car because there was trees falling on the campsite. And my mom, dad, and I were under the car, like hiding from these trees falling all over. Okay. Now, now pretend that you remember the answer. Just go with it. What decision did you make about life based on that moment? It's unpredictable. It's exciting. Okay. So I'm going to tell you, Ian, I... And we've only known you for about 40 minutes now, but 
does the phrase that it's unpredictable but exciting permeate how you live your life? 100%. The motto is it's a damn good day to have a damn good day, right? Right. It came from that decision that you made about life. Now, what we just did, I can do with anyone. You are one of the 3% of the world that has a positive first memory. Because what happens with, and by the way, it was not all that positive. There were trees falling down. And what happens when a, a memory, the way you store that first memory, it's usually a little traumatic because that's what fires your neurons. And then it's the decision that you make about it. Now you could have made a lot of different decisions. You could have made a decision that life is scary and we should run from it. You didn't do that. And I will tell you, I only need to fix the 97% of people who made a really bad first decision because your four-year-old drives your bus. So you're about four or five. How old were you when that, you had that happened? I don't, maybe like five. I don't, I have no idea. That's the perfect age. That is when you formulate your hard drive. So you have this dangerous, but exciting way of living life. Plus you have the support of your mom and dad in this first memory. Right. So I predict that you won't get married for the next eight to 10 years because you want it to last a lifetime. And you'll know that you need to live your life and you may fall in love a couple of times, but you're going to wait because the person that needs to be your walk down life with you is somebody who also appreciates that. And you, yes. Yeah. Kind of crazy. And you can tell all of that by doing the work that I do with people. It's powerful. And this is, uh, you know, I, I don't have like a nearly the experience you do, but I, I do find that it's really easy to fall in love, but it's really hard to break up. You know? Oh, that, you know, that's funny that you say that my very first love when I was 21 years old, his name is Gary. He came to my first wedding. He's very happily married, never had any kids. He's my daughter's godfather. I talked to him two days ago, uh, because we still talk. He's the man that I first fell in love with, right? Not a threat to Joshua. But he did remind me that he's like my brother. We've known each other for 40 years and we both value that relationship because it's, I don't lose people. Once I love you, you're loved forever, unless you really, really hurt me. And then I love you and hate you all at the same time. But I don't, my second boyfriend in life was a beautiful stunt man and I love him. And we still talk because it's hard to find people when you give your heart to somebody, if you close the door so closed, that seems kind of sad. You don't have to be with them. You don't have to live with them but I love loving people. I just do. Right. And it goes and shows with all the relationships you've had. That's, that's, it's amazing. And I know I could talk to you forever about all of these topics. There's one signature question we always ask, cause it's, I just love it. And if it's, if you could go back in time and travel back to maybe, you know, 16, 17 years old, and you could have told yourself right now, 61 looking, looking thirties, Forbes talking to the early you, what would you, maybe one, two or three things that you would have told yourself that could have saved you, you know, a ton of time, money, tears, uh, just scratches, right? And, and the, the best answer is I wouldn't have changed anything because it made me who I am today. But, you know. Well, I just got very, very, very emotional because 16 or 17 was a really, really hard year for me. And I wouldn't change anything because I wouldn't have Riker and McKenna and Joshua. However, what I would love to have whispered into the ear of that little 16 year old girl who walked into this beauty pageant, had gotten her nose fixed because her doctor, my dad's doctor offered to do it for free. I would have whispered into her ear that she shouldn't be so sad, that she's a lot prettier than she ever will imagine that she is, Ugh. that people will like her because I was a very lonely kid who didn't have a lot of friends and that it's just gonna be okay. I spent, 15 years of my life, just not being happy in my heart, of remembering being so ugly and so bullied and so lonely. And I didn't stop to really appreciate a lot of the things that I accomplished. I own a television studio. I have a hundred foot wall on one side of it. And I have, in my spare time, I used to love to scrapbook. I completely put every experience of mine up on this wall because I took pictures I was in the Miss Teenage America pageant when I was 16 with Bob Hope. At 18, I was on the $20,000 pyramid. I've starred on Broadway with Christopher Reeve. I've starred with Lily Tomlin. I helped create the very first X Games with Stuart Scott. Two talk shows, 194 infomercials. Worked with everybody from Billy Mays to Kim Kardashian, gave her her first show, to Billy Blanks from Ty Bo I have accomplished 15 lives, and I knew it, but I was so busy doing that I didn't take a moment to appreciate, one, how spectacular that was because of the need to just keep moving forward, keep moving forward, maybe no one, maybe finally somebody will notice me or I'll, or I'll be happy. Again, I couldn't change any of that, but I would have liked to enjoy the ride more. 
It's like I was on the best roller coaster in the world with ups and downs that saw the entire world, but I was blindfolded and had earphones on. And so I went through it all, but I didn't appreciate it all. And I didn't love me as much as I probably should have. And in this age, I'm finally discovering how cool I am and how much fun I am. Man, uh, if I can do that for anybody, especially you right now, to shave off 10 or 20 years, that as you're going through life, I was told at my first wedding, that's exactly it. If you don't stop and look at each other during that day, the day will be over and you'll have missed it. The day that you plan for your whole life, take a moment and stand there and thank God, thank yourself. Look at your mom and dad if they're there, say hi to people for real and then hug the man that you're gonna spend the rest of your life with. And remember that this is day one. And I thought very often in an award show or something spectacular, I will stop and just get very emotional and just go, wow, this is your life. This is as good as it gets. If this is today, enjoy it to no end, be happy, love on everybody as much as you can. And people, you know, funny when you love on them, they smile back. Some people don't, but most people are like, I was, you know what I did the other day, Ian, I'm so crazy. I was in the grocery store parking lot and a rock and roll crazy song that I love came on. I opened the door, I cranked it on high and I started dancing in the parking lot. And so did the guy who was pushing the carts. And so did the old man and his wife in the parking lot for no apparent reason whatsoever. Just to remember that today may be all that we get. We should totally, totally enjoy it. There it is. I love wearing these shirts everywhere I go. Number one, I don't need to worry about what I wear. And number two, people just treat me better, you know? All right, so here's the deal that I'm going to do for you. I'm going to, you're going to trade me a shirt and I'm going to send you a spin gym because brother, as you're doing this, you need to understand the joy of having a spin gym in your life. Give one to your mom, your new girlfriend. I got to tell you, this is fun to do and I'm going to excited to see the reaction when I'm wearing it's a damn good day t-shirt. There it is. Forbes, how can everyone continue to follow you, follow your journey? Where should they go? You know, it's simple. Just go to ForbesRiley.com. It's a whole list of, of things there. There's free gifts. There's ways to find me all over social media. My name is everything to me. So anytime you want to reach out and please note that on my Facebook or Instagram, I am still the one who answers my private messages. Uh, I fight very hard for that. I spend hours a day wherever else I'm doing, even on the exercise bike. But I love to connect to people because I remember a time when I didn't matter to anybody. And I think if I can make someone feel important by acknowledging them, people always say, oh my God, is it really you? I'm like, yeah, it is me. So for as long as I can do that, I guess when you get to Kim Kardashian's state of 220 million fans, maybe not. But right now I got you. So reach out, say hi. And one last thing, every Sunday live, I've been doing this since COVID started, every Sunday live on Zoom for $19. I'm not giving it for free anymore because I think that people value what they spend money on, what they invest in. But I spend two hours doing a thing called Pitch Secrets Master Class. It's interactive. You really want to meet me? You want to run your business by me? I have created mega millionaires. I've gotten people TV shows on award shows on infomercials. And if you got the courage, because even though I say this, Ian, most people don't take advantage of it. So go, it's, it's there under ForbesRiley.com. Look for it and I'll see you on a Sunday. There it is. You're an angel. We appreciate you and looking forward to staying in touch and running this back till next time. All right. Mwah. And I have to have you on my radio show as well. You are awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to another episode. Remember, hope is not a strategy. Keep making moves. Till next time, peace.